Hello, this is uh, Professor Coughlin, Peter Coughlin, um, and this is a recording for a presentation or a lecture on the market forces of supply and demand. This corresponds with the textbook chapter 4 of MANQ. Note that we've gone through chapter 1 and 2, we're now on chapter 4. Chapter 3 is about gains from trade. Uh, but we're going to cover that chapter later um, in conjunction with chapter, I think it's 7, on international trade. And so those two chapters, in my mind, certainly go very well together. And so we're going to, if you will, go a little bit out of order, but in an order that I think makes logical sense. Um, I am recording this presentation because, unfortunately, I cannot be in Monterey um, this week to actually hold class in person. Um, prior to being asked to teach this GB3070 this quarter, I was committed to a uh, program in the Center of Homeland Defense and Security in Harpers Ferry. So I am recording this lecture. I'm also posting these slides on Applia um, for you to view. You don't have to view it during the class time uh, as scheduled, but uh, to view it certainly preferably before we meet for or before our next scheduled class, which is on Wednesday of this week, when we will actually be conducting a market experiment um, in which you will engage and you will become the market forces of supply and demand. All right, so. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, <clears throat> so understand that you know it's something we take for granted in many ways. But think about the evolution of supply and demand and where it comes from, and you know why, um, uh, you know, how market economy sort of developed. And you know the market economy presumably, to some degree, it developed you know, thousands or millions of years ago. Um, I don't know my anthropology too well, but certainly you know here is the example of a one caveman said, "Geez, I wish I had a rock." Another one said, "I wish I had a stick." And, one has the one who wants a rock has a stick. One has a stick wants a. One has a stick wants a rock. One who has a rock wants a stick. And trade is possible. And so, that really gives you idea of the origin of you know ultimately where it develops. There's actually a video which I'll probably post a link online. It's kind of silly, if you will, but it actually takes that BC cartoon I just showed even further and talks about how a whole economy uh, can evolve from the basic matching of people who have something that somebody else wants and somebody else has something that they want um, and how trade sort of develops and it's called caveonomics. It's actually by Morgan Spurlock if you're familiar with Super Size Me and he's done a couple other documentary films that have been very, very successful. So there's the link right there to the, to the it's actually, just, there's a set of these films in the We the Economy uh, series and I'm actually going to show a couple of them maybe during class at some point um, but uh, I may post the link and you're certainly encouraged to look at it. Uh, it's certainly not required but it just gives you the basics of how, you know, um, the idea of, of how supply and demand, the origins of supply and demand, how market economies, uh, you know, develop naturally. Um, and, of course, once you have supply and demand, um, the idea here is that you have, you know, um, needs from the demand side, you have products or services from the supply side, and they meet together in a market, you know, where the exchanges take place. Um, so the agenda that we're going to talk about is, there's four big topics. First is markets and competition. Second is demand. The third is supply. And the fourth is simply putting supply and demand together. But we'll have subtopics under each. Um, but first, in terms of markets and competition, um, suppose, I suppose the first thing to do is define a market. What do we mean by a market? Well, a market is ultimately any group of buyers and sellers of a particular product or service. It doesn't need to be a market place in particular, or we certainly know we have online markets, um, and, but if you have any groups of buyers and sellers who are interested in exchanging a particular product or service, that's you know, what we consider a market. A competitive market, which is what we're going to focus on a lot, is this idea of one with many buyers and sellers, in which there's actually competition, you know, um, where buyers compete uh, to buy from sellers and sellers compete to sell to buyers. Right. But the idea is there's many buyers and sellers, and, and none of them has a any what we call market power. Each of them has a neg negligible effect on price. So, you know, I can't, you know, cause the market price to to go down if I'm a buyer and get it cheaper than everybody else, and nor can I cause individually the price to go up if I'm a seller and try to get higher profit. We're actually going to talk about what economists call perfectly competitive market. And perfectly competitive markets have a number of features, but most importantly, are that there are first, as we said, many sellers. So here we have an example of many different sellers of hot dogs, many hot dog vendors. The products are essentially identical. Right? They're all selling the same basic hot dog in a bun, um, not much difference. And there's many buyers, all of whom you know, could buy from any one of these sellers. 
and, and would be indifferent who they bought from. You know, they're just trying to get the best deal for their hot dog. So again, there's the definition of words. In a perfectly competitive market, all goods are essentially the same. Buyers and sellers are so numerous that no one can affect the market price. And we, we call these a price taker. A price maker would be someone like a monopolist who gets to choose what the price is they sell their goods. A price taker uh, is someone who uh, basically has to accept the market price as given. Um, if you are a seller and you try to sell for a higher price than the market price, nobody's going to buy from you because there's enough other sellers out there. If you're a buyer and you try to buy for less than the market price uh, to save some money, you're not going to find anybody selling to you because they can all sell at the higher you know, um, prevailing market price. So that's the sense in which both buyers and sellers in these markets are price takers. Now we're going to focus on perfectly competitive markets. Um, and it is an extreme sort of the scenarios are, are, are certainly one end of the spectrum in terms of levels of competition. You have everything from a perfectly competitive market to a, you know, more of an more of a um, oligopoly, which is certainly a chapter in the book on oligopoly and monopoly. And the reason we do this is, first of all, that uh, we do later on, you know, uh, uh, both in this course, but primarily now they've moved it to GB forty seventy one. Talk about monopoly and oligopoly markets, markets in which which are not perfectly competitive. When there are certain players who do have some market power and, and don't have to be price takers. But more importantly, what's remarkable is that many of the results that you get from a competitive market, a perfectly competitive market, generalize to markets that arguably aren't you know perfectly competitive. In other words, maybe you have four or five firms, and yeah, that's not a lot of firms, so shouldn't it be a little less competitive? And it turns out, in many cases, no, it's, it behaves as if. So in other words, many markets that don't necessarily meet the strict assumptions of a perfectly competitive market still behave as if they were perfectly competitive, and therefore, analyzing and assuming it's perfectly competitive um, gives us some great insights. Remember, going back to last class, this idea of the reason we make assumptions and models, we simplify things, and all models are, by definition, wrong, because they assume certain things away, but they are nonetheless very useful. All right, so let's first talk about, of course, supply and demand. We're actually going to talk about demand first, and, and that's primarily because that's something, as consumers, we are a lot more familiar with. You know, not too many of us have, have run our own business and have thought about the supply side of things. Of course, that's why you go to business school. But let's think about demand. So first, we want to define some terms that are get thrown around and unfortunately get confused sometimes. The first is quantity demanded. Quantity demanded is the amount of a good that buyers are willing and able to purchase, right? And so uh, we, we, we typically see it written as Q, you know, superscript D. That's the quantity demanded. Demand schedule is a table that shows the relationship between the price of the good and the quantity demanded. So for any given price on one call on the table, we then say what the quantity demanded is at that price. And finally, a demand curve is a graph of the relationship between the price of a good and the quantity demanded. Right. So again, quantity demanded is a number, the, de the demand schedule is sort of a table, and the demand curve is a graph. And these are all different ways of representing demand. So under the topic of demand, we have four subtopics here. Individual demand, then market demand, the law of demand, and finally demand side dynamics. So let's first talk about individual demand. So individual demand is driven by willingness to pay. Willingness to pay is going to dictate, and when we say individual demand, we mean what an individual consumer demands. What, for what price, again going back to the definition before of the demand schedule, demand curve, is for a given price, how much is demanded? Well, what an individual will demand is driven by their willingness to pay. And willingness to pay is a measure of the value that a buyer has for a product or service. Um, and it's also the maximum amount the buyer would pay for the product or service. So the idea is the best and final offer. If, if, if it was indeed a take it or leave it and you had no other option, right? what is the most you would ever be willing to pay? Now willingness to pay, it's very important to understand, is not the same as price. Right? So we have price of, here example of $99.99 on this price tag. Right? Price is what you would actually pay. Willingness to pay what you'd be willing to pay. Right? Um, it's very unlikely, if you buy something and the price tag is $99.99, it's very unlikely your willingness to pay is exactly $99.99. Right? There's a reason those prices are chosen and why they use $0.99, cents, et cetera, and there's you know, the psychology of marketing. But the point is that willingness to pay is not the same as price. What you have to pay by price, prices, as we'll see later, is dictated by both supply and demand. It's dictated by things like scarcity. Right? Um, but you know, the, the, this is 
emphasized by the classic what we call the diamonds and water paradox. Think about diamonds. Diamonds are very, very expensive, right? Um, but if the entire world supply of diamonds suddenly disappeared, um, we'd be inconvenienced, but the but we it wouldn't be a you know huge disaster. Compare that to water. Water is relatively cheap, right? Um, but if the entire world supply of water suddenly disappeared, it would be a disaster. Obviously, right? We would all die. Yeah. So why is it that something that is you know basically a convenience is expensive, and something that is a necessity is fairly inexpensive? Right? Um, certainly, tap water is essentially free. Well, the answer is because of scarcity, right? It's not that diamonds are inherently more valuable than water. It's that diamonds are scarcer than water. And so, again, we don't want to confuse willingness to pay with price. What you'd be willing to pay, you know, for example, to, to uh, have water, if the alternative is no water at all of any kind, juice or other juice, soda, soup, otherwise, right? What you're willing to pay is immense because if you didn't have it, you'd die. But what you actually have to pay is certainly much less. Now, different individuals, of course, have different levels of willingness to pay for the same product or service. And so, um, willingness to pay, whereas the price might be the same, they might all pay the same price in many cases. Their willingness to pay is presumably quite different. Right? And different individuals, it might, might differ by a lot in this, in this diagram here. I'm not sure where I got this picture, but, you know, there's not a lot of difference. And, you know, we see the highest is 128, it looks like, the lowest is 122.75. Right? Not a big difference. But the point is that individuals will have different willingness to pay. An important feature of the willingness to pay is that um, as your quantity of something goes up, as the quantity consumed goes up, your marginal willingness to pay goes down. Your marginal utility, in other words, the additional value that you get from more more units, you know, decreases as the quantity consumed increases. Um, so here's an example of a of of, of um, Morris the mouse, let's say. So Morris the mouse is measuring sort of his happiness as the number of cookies he gets to eat, right? And so, you know, if he goes from, you know, in this example, you see if he goes from three to four cookies, right? He's had three cookies, you get a fourth cookie, right? His happiness goes up, um, and it goes up by a, you know, fairly big amount. Not as much as it went from going from zero to one, but still a lot. By the time he's had 28 cookies, right? You offer Morris that 29th cookie, right? He's really... He's stuffed. You know, that 29th cookie, you know, it's better than nothing. You know, worst case scenario, you can trash it, I guess. But the point is, there's not a lot of increase in additional utility. And so, there's not a lot of increase in, he's not willing to pay as much for that 29th unit as he was willing to pay for the fourth unit. And that's this idea of decreasing marginal utility, decreasing willingness to pay as the quantity consumed goes up. And that's important uh, when it comes to understanding the individual demand curve. Right. The individual demand curve maps out an individual's willingness to pay for every, any given quantity of a product or service. Right. Um, so the idea is, think about, you know, it's, it's, it's price on the vertical axis, it's the quantity on the horizontal axis, right? And because the idea is certainly at lower prices, you're willing to consume more, right? But the idea is that ultimately the shape, the fact that the curve, the, you're willing to consume more, but the fact that the curve slopes down, Right, as opposed to say, you know, if your willingness to pay for a cookie was two dollars, and you were going to willing to buy zero below two dollars, and willing to buy as many as you get your hands on above two dollars, right? Then, then you your demand curve would not slope down. In fact, it would be essentially you'd be you would demand zero for any price under two dollars, and you'd demand an infinite amount once it hit two dollars, right? Because but it slopes down because you are willing to consume you know, more, but you're not willing to, you know, as you consume more, your value changes. So it's not that you have a willingness to pay of $2 for any quantity of cookies. It might be $2 for the first cookie, $1.50 for the second one, etc. And therefore, you end up with a demand curve that slopes downward to see this, right? So here's an example of individual demand for lattes. Right? Um, and so we, we see that on the right we have, remember, this is what we call the demand schedule. You know, for any given price of lattes, the quantity of lattes demanded. And we can see here, let's map out, for example, that first point. Even if cool lattes are free, right, this person, this is the lattes per week, right? They wouldn't, couldn't possibly consume the 16 lattes per week. And, um, you know, presumably they can't resell them either, you know. Um, and so, so even if they're free, the most lattes that this individual would consume is 16, right? 
Um, for a dollar, they they would consume 14 in a week. At a price of $2, they'd consume 12 in a week. And so again, you see that we're plotting out these points in the graph on the left. Of course, on the left, remember the graph of your demand, of uh, the quantity demanded for any given price, is called the demand curve. On the right is the demand schedule. Again, $3, the quantity of lattes demanded is 10. $4, the quantity of latte demanded 8. $5, $6, etc. And if we connect those, that is our individual, oops, that is our demand curve. Now we've gone from our demand schedule here on the right to our individual demand curve. Um, well, that's sort of how individual demand works. The key lessons there being that it's driven by willingness to pay, and that the willingness to pay decreases the more you consume. Or the willingness to pay for each additional unit certainly decreases the more you consume. What about market demand? So now what if we take the whole market, so, you know, all of the consumers in the market? Well, the market demand is certainly is simply the sum of all individual demands, right, for a particular good or service. Right? And so the market demand curve is the horizontal sum of the individual demand curves. Right? So you sort of add up the consumption of all individuals. So let's think about that. So previously, we actually had the first two columns in this diagram. We already saw that that was the individual demand. We had for any given price what Helen's uh, quantity demanded was. Right? Well, now let's suppose we add in Ken. Now you know these are the, now we have two consumers. That's the only consumers in the entire latte market here in this example, right? Helen and Ken, right? And so we see Ken's quantity demanded for any given price, eight seven six five four three two, right? this column here. And if we the the market demand then the market quantity demand it would simply be the sum of them, right? Just add those up. So for any given price, the market quantity demanded would be Helen's quantity demanded plus Ken's quantity demanded, and we will then of course just like we did when we plotted out Helen's demand curve based on her demand schedule, we can now take the market demand schedule, which is here, right? These numbers that you see are directly from this prior table. Um, and we now get the demand curve on the left, which is the market demand curve. All right, so putting those together, right? We've talked about individual demand. Now we've talked about market demand. It's simply the sum of the individual demands. Um, we now get to the law of demand. What is the law of demand? Well, the law of demand says that the quantity demanded of a good falls when the price of the good rises. Right? So, again, as the price of a good goes up, the quantity demanded of that good goes down. Right? There's an inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded. Now, the other way around as well, if as price goes down, quantity demanded goes up. Um, and that is the law of demand. Now, to go into more detail or more specific, remember, you know, the, the, but the, well, first of all, what we conclude from this, this means that demand curves slope down, as we've just seen. We've seen it both in the individual demand and the, in the market demand. Because as price goes up, quantity demand goes down, therefore, that's going to result in a demand curve sloping down. And the way to remember that, one way to remember that, I still, even as an economist for, many, for decades now, remember it, is demand to the land. Demand goes down. A demand curve slopes down. It goes down to, to the land. Now, going back to what we sort of already learned, remember individual demand curves so we slope down. Why do they slope down? Well, because we said the marginal willingness to pay decreases as the quantity increases. Again, the marginal benefit you get from something, the additional benefit you get from the 21st Apple or the 8th TV in your house, you know, is not the same as you got from the first one. And so the because your value of these additional units goes down as you consume more, um, that's going to result in demand curves that slope down, individual demand curves. Why do market demand curves slope down? Well, first reason is because they are the horizontal sum of downward sloping individual demand curves, right? I mean, if you add up, if you have several individual demand curves that are downward sloping, you add them up, right? you're going to get a market demand curve that's also downward sloping. But there's something else, right? Here, and we'll go more into it, you'll see this um, both in the experimental market we do on Wednesday of this week, as well as going forward when we look at, you know, sort of um, uh, consumer surplus and efficiency. Think about this, is that at some prices, you are not willing to consume any, right? And the idea is that think about a very high price for something, you know, say a very high price, say the price for a Mercedes, right? Um, as the price gets lower, right? It's what happens is buyers who were willing to consume zero, right, it's just too expensive for them, are willing to, hey, yeah, I'll buy a Mercedes, right? And the idea is that what happens as price goes down, um, it's not just that individuals consume more, 
but that individuals go from consuming nothing to consuming one. Right? And, and a car is a good example because not too many people are going to buy multiple Mercedes. But hey, for the right price, you know, you give me a Mercedes for five thousand dollars, I'll buy a couple of them, you know, a few of them. But the point is that what happens is as the price goes down. So this is reason number two here at the bottom, right? That buyers enter the whoops. The buyers enter the market when the price drops below their willingness to pay for that first unit. What is a Mercedes worth to me? What is one Mercedes worth to me? Right? As soon as the price goes down below that, I get into the market. And so as price goes down, more buyers enter the market, which means there's a greater quantity demanded at lower prices, and therefore the demand curve slopes downward. All right. So that's the law of demand. What about demand side dynamics? And so again, dynamic, you know, root word, Latin, something or other for change, right? So about changes on the demand side. So well, there's two types of changes we have to talk about, the demand side dynamics. One is what we call change in the quantity demanded, right? Um, and this is, remember, remember going back, remember quantity demanded, uh, we had, had, which, was, which, was, which was a number, right? Um, and then we had demand schedule and demand curve, right? So change in quantity demanded is simply a change in that number, right? And it is movement along the demand curve, right? And it's caused by a change in the price of the product. And that is, in fact, think about it, that is what the demand curve tells you. It says for a change in the price, how does the quantity demand change? And so we have change in quantity demand, and we're simply talking about a change in price, which causes the change, a change in the quantity demanded. That is a movement along the demand curve. The other type of demand side dynamic is a change in demand. Okay. Again, previously, just you know, go back to the previous slide, change in quantity demanded. Now what we call change in demand. Right? And this is what, something that will cause a change in your demand schedule or your demand curve. It is a shift in the demand curve, either to the left or right, right? caused by any change that alters the quantity demanded at every price. Remember, the demand curve, the vertical axis is price, the horizontal axis is quantity. So the only thing it tells you is the relationship between price and quantity demanded. Right? That's the only thing it tells you. It doesn't tell you the relationship between quantity demanded and income, the relationship between quantity demanded and other prices, the relationship between quantity demanded and weather, the relationship between quantity demanded and, and, and fashion trends. There's all kinds of things that could change the, you know, how much is demanded of a good. But the, the demand curve simply plots out the relationship between price and, the quant and quantity. So if there's something other than price that caused a change in demand, and particularly caused a change in demand at any price, Right? then that's a shift in the demand curve. Here, for example, is a shift to the right. So the idea is that for now, for any given price, right, the quantity demanded is greater in this example. So again, demand side dynamics are either a change in the quantity demanded, which is driven by a change in price, or change in demand, which is driven by any of the other factors that might alter price. Well, what does influence demand? Well, price, as we said, if price changes, that causes a movement along the demand curve. But other variables, right, tastes, number of buyers, right, Income, expectations, the price of related goods, these things all shift the demand curve, right? Because they cause a change in demand at any price, right? As, pr as tastes change and the, there's greater demand for a good because of changes in tastes, right? That's going to cause a uh, shift in the demand curve, change in the quantity demand at any price. As the number of buyers changes, as, as the market grows, then that's going to cause the entire demand curve to shift to the right. If the number of buyers goes down, of course, shift to the left. Income, right? Most goods, the greater your income, the more you buy of it expectations, right? You know, if I expect, you know, the prices to go up in the future, right, then I might buy now. If I expect, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a, a, a gun aficionado and I believe that the new administration is going to ban all handguns or that, oh, I'm going to increase demand now, right? Expectations of the future can shift demand now, right? And the price of related goods, right? We'll talk about complements and substitutes, right? If, if um, you know, the price of software goes down, the demand for hardware goes up, Right? Because now suddenly, you know, if, if PlayStation, uh, what do we have, PlayStation 4 games become really, really cheap, you know, now a PlayStation 4 console becomes much more attractive to me. On the other hand, if, if, if a PlayStation 4 console becomes really expensive, you know, a Xbox console becomes more attractive to me because those are substitutes. So again, substitutes versus complements. We'll talk more about those. So let me, here's active learning. Let's give some examples right, to think about these, these, these demand side dynamics. So consider the demand curve for music downloads, right? And little, some of these are a little, example, a little dated, right? Um, but, but uh, and because even downloads, you know, are, uh, um, you know, uh, well, I actually had to change some of these questions to make them more current, um, uh, but, but they're still a little bit dated. But let's suspend disbelief here. Consider the demand curve for music downloads. What happens to it in each of the following scenarios and why? Suppose the prices of iPods and iPhones fall. 
or B, the price of music downloads falls. And finally, C, the price of CDs falls. Right? So first, the price of iPods and iPhones fall. Right? And, and uh, of course, I, you know, iPods, you can't just say iPod. Nobody has iPods anymore, very few. Certainly, we mostly listen to our digital music downloads on, on mobile devices like uh, iPhones now. So here's a demand curve for music downloads. So we see the price of music downloads in the vertical axis and the quantity of music downloads in the horizontal axis. So what happens if the prices of iPods and iPhones fall? Well, as the prices of iPhones and iPhones fall, therefore there's going to be more people are going to buy iPods and iPhones, right? And there's more iPods and iPhones, then people are going to you know, have greater demand for music downloads, right? Um, in that sense, music downloads and iPods or iPhones are complements, right? A fall in the price of the devices shifts the demand curve for music downloads to the right. You know, complements one the price of one complement of, of a complement gets cheaper, then the demand for if, over the generally speaking, if the price of a product goes down, not only does demand for that product go up, but demand for its complementary products also goes up. Right, and so that's going to cause a shift in the demand curve to the right. Um, a again, this idea of understanding just to to, to drill home the idea of prices and demand for complements. Um, here's an example I found online that might be a bit more amusing, is this idea of, look, as the price of alcohol decreases, right, demand for red solo cups increases, right, because they're complements, right? The more alcohol you, particularly beer, presumably, sort of, you intend to consume or you're going to consume, then the more red solo cups you're going to need. All right, well, the second example in the act of learning was the idea of the price of music downloads falls. So what happens when the price of music downloads falls? Well, that's... Again, let's look at our, I mean, without even thinking too much, look at your diagram. The vertical axis here is price of music downloads, and the horizontal is quantity of music downloads, okay? So if the price of music downloads falls, that is the whole purpose of the demand curve, right? And so the demand curve doesn't shift, right? It, in fact, we just move down along the curve to a point with a lower price and a higher quantity, right? That's the definition of the demand curve, right? So the price of music downloads falls, we know that we follow the demand curve, we move along the curve. Um, and so that again is is the this is the quantity of demand increases the demand doesn't increase per se right the demand curve doesn't shift the demand schedule wouldn't change right we simply have a higher quantity demanded because we have a lower price and finally what are the price of CDs falls right and again this is like I guess a little dated I guess you can still buy CDs people still buy CDs but certainly uh, CDs are one other way to get digital music besides downloads right and what happens as the price of CDs falls? CDs and music downloads are therefore substitutes, right? And, you know, I don't bought a CD in a long time, but there was, certainly was a period even after long after music downloads were introduced, where you know I just like the security of having a CD with my I could burn it to my iTunes if I wanted to, but at least I always had the CD there. Um, and so the idea of CDs and music downloads are substitutes. So if CDs become less expensive, right, I fall in the price of CDs. That's going to shift demand for music downloads to the left. Right? Because now, you know, if I can get the equivalent on a CD, think about this, if you could get a CD for 50 cents, right, you're certainly not going to pay, you know, a dollar for each individual song on that, DD, on that CD to download it. Right? Um, so as the price of a substitute goes, in this case, down, the demand for your product will go down. All right, so that's the story of demand. Let's do the same for supply. We're going to sort of see the same sort of ideas. Well, first of all, Again, we have quantity supplied. Quantity supplied is the amount. It is a number, the amount of goods that sellers are willing and able to sell. The supply schedule is a table that shows the relationship between the price of the good and the quantity supplied. And finally, the supply curve is a graph of the relationship between the price of a good and the quantity supplied. So again, just like quantity of demand, we have these three concepts, quantity supplied, quantity schedule, I'm sorry, supply schedule and supply curve. Quantity supplied being a point, it is a number. Supply schedule is a relationship expressed in a table. Supply curve is also a relationship, but it's expressed in a graph. So what are our subtopics? The same as before, we have individual supply. I'm going to build up from individual supply to the market supply, then the law of supply, and finally supply side dynamics. All right, what about individual supply? Now, individual supply, remember individual demand is driven by willingness to pay. What's your willingness to pay? What's your, in particular, what's your marginal willingness to pay? What's your willingness to pay for one more unit? Right? Well, individual supply is my marginal cost. Right? Your cost of producing that additional unit of output. You know, it, it's, it's, remember that um, economic thinking is thinking at the margin. Right? You think at the margin, marginal benefits, marginal cost. 
Well, you're, how much you're willing to supply for a given price, which is your marginal benefit, that's your revenue, right? Uh, your marginal benefit of, of additional unit is whatever you can get for it, which is the price. Well, what's the cost? Well, what's the marginal cost of producing one more unit? That's what's really going to drive individual supply. It's still measured in terms of opportunity cost, right? The idea is, you know, what is the, you know, what could you, what else could you do with those additional resources, that labor, that time, that money, right? And here, you know, where we could put the, this, this picture here, we put the dollar in pot one, two, or three, right? What's the, what's the best alternative use of those same resources? So we still measure it marginal cost in terms of opportunity cost. So, so we, sometimes it's helpful to call it marginal opportunity cost. That's what it really is, right? Um, and it's ultimately, just like one this pay was the maximum amount a buyer would be willing to pay for a good or service, marginal cost is the minimum amount a seller would accept to provide that product or service, right? And, and it's something that, you know, you have to sort of maybe measure very accurately when you're in business, you know, to make sure that you are, you know, not selling something that, or not, not producing something for which the marginal benefit is less than the marginal cost. Now, remember we said that as quantity increases, or quantity consumed increases, marg or the willingness, marginal willingness to pay goes down. Well, on the supply side, as the quantity produced increases, the marginal opportunity cost goes up. Right? And this is this idea of, of diminishing returns. Right? And it's ultimately driven, this is something that we will illustrate a little bit more in class when I come back from West Virginia, right? But it's something that will be illustrated more deeply in your next econ class, GB4071. We used to do it in GB3070, but now they've uh, sort of taken it into 4071. But it's important, I think it's important you understand the basics of this, right? So the idea is that, of diminishing returns, is that as the output increases, the marginal productivity of inputs decreases. In other words, think about this. You know, if you throw uh, additional, you have a factory, you have your equipment, you have whatever you have, your, your sort of, you know, um, material or your physical capital that you have. As you can certainly add labor in the short run, you can hire new people every week, right? Or you can lay people off, right? But as you change, as you add more labor, right, you're not going to get the same productivity from the 1,000th employee as maybe you got from the 200th employee, right? There comes a point at which you're adding employees, right? Think about the idea of a, of a McDonald's restaurant, right? And, and we want to increase the output that the McDonald's restaurant could possibly sell if there was demand, you know, for it. If you put 100 employees in a McDonald's restaurant, they're probably going to be less productive than if you had you know, 10 employees working there, 15, right? Because this, the size of the store doesn't change, right? The, 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 the cooking surfaces don't change. The number of, 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 of cashiers or cash registers doesn't change. And so you're putting in more inputs, right? When you've got some resources that are fixed, at least in the short run. So the marginal productivity of those inputs of adding additional labor decreases. The additional benefit of hiring those you new know, people decreases. Therefore, what it means is that if each new person each new person you had labor brings less to the table, brings less output. Then in order to increase output by a certain amount, we've got to have even more inputs. Right? So each additional unit of output begins to require more input. Right? The, the, the 20th unit of output might require more inputs than the second unit of output required. What that means, therefore, is the marginal cost of each additional unit increases as output increases. Um, and that is, you know, Increasing marginal cost is something that we will illustrate. We'll do a, actually a simulation in class, and you'll understand it. But it's something that can be counterintuitive to some students, right? Because you are sort of heard this idea, and you preach this idea that as you increase output, you lower cost per unit. You know, greater quantity output equals lower cost per unit. Right? And that's true to some degree, but you know, it's it's it, but particularly in the short run when you cannot expand. That, my, that McDonald's restaurant. You can't add registers. You can't, you know, change the physical layout of the store much in the short run, right? It's not true, right? Um, if you've been a super McDonald's, you know, in the long run, if you could adjust the size of your McDonald's, yeah, that might be true. So the idea is in the long run, yeah, you might get lower cost as you produce more. But even in the long run, there comes a point in which you're straining resources. And so marginal cost does increase as quantity increases. And in particular, marginal cost might decrease for a little bit. In fact, usually it does. Let me actually show you. Typically, a marginal cost curve looks something like this. It goes down for a bit, and then it increases, right? Um, but 
it turns out, as you'll find, not so much in this course, but in GB4071, certainly, when you talk about uh, uh, firms and competitive market and production costs, things like that, it's chapters in ManQ. It's still the ManQ textbook. But what's going to happen is that it turns out the only really relevant part of the marginal cost curve is the part where it increases. And that's going to, it turns out that your, your marginal cost curve you see here is your individual demand curve. I'm sorry, individual supply curve. Again, something that you'll learn, we will explore more when I get back from West Virginia. We'll do demonstration in class, but even to a greater depth in GB4071. So if that's individual supply is driven by marginal cost, individual supply curve is, is something that maps out the quantity of a product or service uh, at an individual seller is willing to supply at any given unit price, right? It's, it's the, again, individual supply curve, what an individual seller, firm, producer, or whatever, will supply for any given price. And again, as we did before, we can map out from the supply schedule we have here on the right, we can map out a supp individual supply curve by plotting those points on our graph and connecting them, and we get an individual supply curve, which is upward sloping, right? Because marginal cost is increasing as output increases. Well, that's individual supply. What about market supply? Well, again, market supply is simply the sum of all individual supplies um, for all sellers of a particular good or service. And it is the simply the horizontal sum of all the individual supply curves. You add up all the firms that are supplying. Right? What If firm A is going to supply you know, four at this price, firm B provides is going to, willing to supply three, firm C is willing to supply two, you know, add those up, my math not wrong, then market supply is nine. And so here we can, you know, again, the example of, of, of lattes, we've already sort of seen one uh, supply schedule for Starbucks, you know, for a given price, what Starbucks is willing to supply. Well, suppose there's a competitor, you know, jitters, a coffee, uh, you know, kiosk, right? And now we see that the market quantity supplied is simply going to be the sum of the two, right? For any given price, what's the total of all individual supplies? And that's going to give you market quantity supply. Right. And again, we can then take this far right column here of market quantity supplied, right, and make it a make our supply schedule, our market supply schedule. It's the, it's the graph on the right for any given price. What's the quantity supplied? And we can then plot out our market demand curve there on the left. Right. So that's covers individual supply, market supply. Now we get to the law of supply. Again, parallel to the law of demand. The law of supply says the quantity supplied of a good rises when the price of the good rises. Um, so again, as price goes up, now, before, remember, there was an inverse relationship. Ah, look at that. I'm going to, in real time, change this slide. Let's see. That should be quantity, oops, supplied. Right, quantity supplied. These slides were just created this weekend. So let's go back. Okay, so as price goes up, quantity supplied goes up. As price goes down, quantity supplied goes down. Right? So again, it's um, uh, whereas there was an inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded, there is a a, a, a positive correlation or correspondence between uh, price and quantity supply. Right? So therefore, because of this relationship, that's why supply curves slope up, and why we had demand to the land, we can say supply to the sky. Again, the way I remember, demand to the land, supply to the sky, demand curves slope down, supply curves slope up. Again, to the individual components, remember that the individual, individual supply curves slope up because marginal costs increase as the quantity increases. Right? And therefore, market supply curves slope up simply because, one, the market supply is the horizontal sum of the upward sloping individual supply curves. So therefore, if you put them together, right, you know, if you, if you, if you sum up if you add, of, uh, several upward sloping curves, you add them together, it's, you know, in a horizontal sum, your resulting curve is going to be upward sloping. But also, again, think about, like the example before, about the suppliers, simply, it's not just a matter of individuals supplying more. Some uh, individuals will go from supplying nothing to supplying something, right? So think about the idea here of, oops, I'm sorry. Get back to where we were. So the idea is that some suppliers will supply nothing, right? Think about the idea of, you know, am I going to put my, you know, um, I have a, you know, suppose I have a vacation home, 
right? a lake house that I use sometimes. Right? Um, am I going to put it on the market? Am I going to supply it to the market? Well, the answer is, what's the price? Right? Um, how much do I use it? But also, what, what price am I willing to supply it? At a certain price, if the, if, if the price of housing, and particularly you know, sort of leisure or, vac or housing, you know, or second or, 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 or uh, vacation homes is low, right? Then I'm not gonna. I mean, I'd rather use it. Right? I'm not gonna sell it. Right? But if the market recovers and the market booms and the in the price of vacation homes goes up, now suddenly I'm willing to supply my vacation home to the market, right? And the idea being that you can that that that's not just individual supply curves where, where suppliers are supplying multiple units and supplying more units as price goes up. It might be a market where you know suppliers are either in or out. Right? And as the price goes up, right, more suppliers are willing and can make a profit at that price, therefore more suppliers go in. Right? All right. So finally so finally under at least supply is the idea of supply side dynamics. Right? We have the same sort of changes. So again we have the same two types of changes. We have change in quantity supplied which is a movement along the supply curve, right? Um, and this is simply when we have a change in the price of the product. If the price changes, that's what a supply curve tells us. It tells us how's the, how the quantity supply changes as the price changes. Um, but a change in supply, as opposed to, again, here's change in quantity supply, a change in supply, we're talking about a change in the entire supply schedule or the supply curve. It is a shift in the supply curve. Right. Uh, either to the left or the right. It's caused by any change that alters the quantity supplied at every price. Right? Again, the supply curve tells us the quantity is supplied for any given price. And as price changes, it does not tell us the quantity, how quantity supplied changes as you know the technology changes, as the cost of inputs changes, as you know the number of firms changes, as these other things sort of change. Right? All of those things cause shifts in the supply curve. Right? And so in this example, we see that here we have a shift in the supply curve to the right, meaning that at any given price, the amount supplied has gone up. So what are some variables that influence supply? Price, again, causes a movement along the supply curve. Right? The number of sellers, input prices, technology, expectations, those all shift the supply curve. Right? So again, you know, uh, you know, number of sellers, obviously there's more sellers, that's greater supply, that's going to cause the supply curve to shift out as the number of sellers increases. Input prices change, if they go down, then now we can supply more at any given price, right? Because our, our costs have gone down. If input prices go down, that's gonna that's gonna shift the supply curve you know, to the right outward. If input prices go up, we now can supply less at any given price, so that's gonna cause the supply curve to shift backwards, right? Uh, as technology changes, we can do something more efficiently, for example. Again, that's gonna cause a supply curve to shift outward as it makes it we can you know, we can supply more affordably at any given price. Expectations, the same way as for consumers, right? If I expect that, um, you know, think about the idea of, of supply of, you know, concert tickets, right? Um, as expectations change in terms of whether or not I think people are going to, is it an outdoor concert? Is it going to rain? You know, I might change, you know, how, you know, the price at which I'm willing to supply my concert ticket because now I think people are, are might not be willing to buy as much. Uh, the, you know, or what do I think is going to happen in terms of future technology? What do I think is going to happen? I mean, all these things, if I think there's going to be a, uh, a, a, an embargo, you know, on oil. I might uh, try to, you know, demand a higher price for my oil now. I mean, there's all sorts of things that go on expectations that could shift the supply curve the way they did the demand curve. All right, so let's, let's again think of some examples here, this time with the supply curve, right? So consider the supply curve for tax preparation software, right? What happens to it in each of the following scenarios? A, retailers cut the price of the software. B, a technological advance allows the software to be produced at lower costs. Or C, professional tax return preparers raise the price of the services they provide. All right, so here, um, first, A, a fall in the price of the tax return software. Well, again, look at your graph, right? Uh, it's on the left there, price of tax return software. That's what this diagram tells you. It tells you how changes in the price of tax return software affect the quantity supplied, right? So a change in the price of the product itself, not some other product, but the product itself that you're looking at, right, for which you have a supply curve. If the price of that item changes, right, the supply curve is not shifting, it's just moving along the curve. In this case, because it's a fall in the price, the, you move along the curve, and the quantity supplied goes down. Right? Scenario B is a fall in the cost of producing the software. So now suddenly it's cheaper to make the software. Maybe we've got cheaper you know, software engineers, you know, or whatever to, to program, uh, or we've got new innovation that allows us to program the software less expensively. 
what's that going to do? Well, now for any given price, we can we can supply more software affordably, right? Or we're willing to supply the same amount of software at a lower price. Another way to think about it, right? It's going to shift the supply curve to the right, right? So at each price, the quantity supplied is increasing. Um, so this is a change in input prices and how that affects the supply curve. And the final example is the idea of professional preparers raise their price. Right? So again, the price of this is this is use at home tax return software. So whether you buy you know some Quicken or you know TurboTax or whatever some tax return software for yourself to use at home, a professional preparer is the alternative is a substitute. So what they're saying is what happens when the price of the substitute goes up. What happens to the supply curve for tax return software? And think about that for a second. And it's a bit of a trick, right? Because when the price of a for professional preparers raise their price, that does affect the market for tax return software, but not on the supply side, on the demand side. Right? It's a bit of a trick, a trick question. Right? As prof if professional preparers raise their price, this shifts the demand curve for tax preparation software, not the supply curve. Right? Now suddenly people are demanding more tax return software because the alternative is more expensive, a professional tax preparer. Right? But it doesn't change the supply curve. Right? It doesn't change the costs of, of providing. It doesn't change anything right, that makes a decision about what you're willing to sell, you know, what price you're willing to sell. It doesn't change your opportunity costs or your marginal costs, right? so, which is ultimately what's going to drive that supply curve. So to summarize sort of these, these ideas, these terms, just vocabulary for shifts versus movement along the curves. Right? A change in demand is a shift in the demand curve. Right? It occurs whenever a non-price, something other than price, you know, changes. A non-determinant demand, non-price determinant of demand changes, like income or the number of buyers. Right? A change in quantity demanded, on the other hand, is a movement along, a fixed demand curve. Right? And that occurs when price changes. Similarly, a change in supply is a shift in the supply curve. And it occurs when a non-price determinant of supply changes, like technology or costs, right, anything other than price. And a change in the quantity supplied is simply a movement along a fixed supply curve. And that occurs when we have a change in price. So our last topic uh, the big topic is supply and demand together, putting it all together. And it's important to understand, we've talked about the drivers of demand, the drivers of supply, right? But understand that these things are, you know, always working in constant balance, right? The idea is, of, is, is, is a balancing of supply and demand, and that's what, what market economics is all about, right? And uh, just to put a, a little bit of a humorous hint on it, right? You can't just look at supply, and you can't just look at demand to get your answer. Right? Here we see two Eskimos. Um, and uh, one of them is trying to sell snow cones, you know, in Alaska or the Northern Territories, wherever it might be, to which his friend says, trust me, Harold, it's not supply or demand, it's supply and demand. Right? Uh, you know, just because you've got the supply doesn't mean there's going to be a market. You've got to have both the supply, in this case of snow cones, but also demand for snow cones, which are unlikely in this Eskimo territory. Um, similar idea, this cartoon about the delicate balance of supply and demand. Right? Here's a man on the street, the table, selling batting helmets for $25, you know, which is obviously a curiosity to this businessman walking along, wondering why there is this supply of batting helmets you know, uh, at that particular location. Right? Where's the demand come from? Well, he will soon find out where the demand for those batting helmets comes from. Right? Again, the delicate balance of supply and demand. Um, now, so under this topic, supply and demand together, we actually have, um, you know, four subtopics about market equilibrium, about markets not in equilibrium, about change in equilibrium, and finally about prices and resource allocation. So market equilibrium, and what do we mean by that, right? So, so the idea is it's ultimately all about this balance, right? And, you know, and I'm reminded here, I put a quote in, quote in there, happiness in life is a matter of equilibrium, right? It's about balance, it's about big balance in life. Well, the same thing is true in markets, right? Market equilibrium is this idea that we're at equilibrium when price has reached the level where quantity supplied equals quantity demanded. Right? 
Um, and so therefore we can, you know, here in this example, you know, we have, you know, at a price of three dollars, the quantity supplied is fifteen, and the quantity demanded is fifteen. There's a demand curve, demand, demand to the land, supply to the sky. And so this uh, first equilibrium consists of an equilibrium price, which is the price that equates quantity supplied with quantity demanded. Right? At what price is the quantity supplied equal to quantity demanded? Well, it turns out that a price of three dollars. Right? At a price of three dollars, the quantity demanded is exactly equal to the quantity supplied. The other component of equilibrium, of course, is the equilibrium quantity, right? which is the quantity supplied and quantity demanded at that equilibrium price. So at equilibrium, What's the quantity supplied and quantity demanded? They're, they've got to be the same, right? And it turns out it's 15. At, a, at the equilibrium price of $3, right? Quantity demanded is 15, the quantity supplied is 15. And that's what makes it, of course, an equilibrium. So, straightforward enough, what, up, what happens when we think about markets not in equilibrium? So, understand this idea of what happens when we're not in equilibrium. In particular, what we'll see is that markets that are not in equilibrium tend to be pushed towards equilibrium, right? Um, so consider a scenario of surplus, right? The surplus or excess supply, right? Where the quantity supplied is greater than the quantity demanded. So that might occur, for example, suppose the market price was $5, or the price was $5. Well, at that price, right, then what we see is, we see again, notice the supply curve, right? Supply to the sky, demand to the land. So where the supply curve is sloping up, demand curve is sloping down. Notice where these curves are and where they are you know, what this says about what quantity demand and quantity supplied is at a price of five. So the demand curve says, look, where five dollars intersects the demand curve is at, a, is at a quantity of nine. So therefore the quantity demanded at a price of five is nine lattes, in this, again, our latte example. The quantity supplied is 25, right? So if the price is five dollars, we have 25 lattes being willingly, willingly supplied, but only nine willingly consumed. And therefore, we have a surplus of 16 lattes. So the distance, difference, or the distance, the horizontal distance between those two curves at that price, or the difference between the quantity supplied and quantity demanded at that price, is the measure of the surplus. So we have a surplus of 16 lattes. Well, what's going to happen? So the idea is now think about you know the Starbucks versus Jitters competing, and they're supplying you know there's more than is willingly consumed. Well, what that means is that facing that surplus, somebody isn't consuming. I, I want to supply more coffee, but people aren't willing to buy. So if you want to increase your sales, you're going to have to cut your price. So Starbucks or Jitters or whatever cuts their price, right? Let's suppose they cut their price down to $4, right? Now suddenly when they cut their price down to $4, the quantity demanded increases. It looks up to about 12 right? And the quantity supplied falls, right? Now the quantity supplied at a price of $4 is only 20 right? We still have a surplus, but the surplus is smaller now. Right? And so lowering your so, so there's a natural pressure within the presence of a surplus for sellers to try to increase their sales by cutting the price, and that reduces the surplus. Well, that continues, right? There's going to be further pressure to reduce because there's still a surplus to lower the price even more until you get to a point where the quantity supplied equals quantity demanded. And so in the presence of a surplus, right, you're going to have excess supply. It's going to push downward, put downward pressure on prices, which will push the market back towards equilibrium. What about the other side? Suppose a shortage, right? So we have excess demand. Okay. So this is when a, a shortage is when the quantity demanded is greater than the quantity supplied. Again, excess demand. So suppose the price is only one dollar. Right? In this case, the quantity demanded is twenty-one lattes. Right? That's where the the supply curve. I'm sorry, the demand curve intersects the price of one dollars at a quantity of twenty-one. And the quantity supply is only five lattes. That's where the supply curve intersects the price of one dollars. That means there's a shortage of 16 lattes instead of being a surplus. Now, people at a price of a dollar, people are saying, hey, I want a latte, and they're not getting one because, because producers are saying, you know, I can't affordably provide, you know, more than combined, we can't affordably provide more than five lattes. So if the price is only one dollars, one dollar, we're not gonna um, supply more than five lattes. So what's going to happen? Well, so now there's a shortage. People are asking for lattes um, and not getting them, so I realize, hey, I can raise my price right? and still and sell more lattes. Right? And so sellers will raise their price, right? which when you raise your price, now suddenly fewer people are screaming for the lattes, so the quantity demand will fall, right? and the quantity supply will rise. Right? And if you've only, in this case, for example, raised the price from $1 to $2, you still have a shortage, but you reduced it. Right? Now there's a fewer people demanding lattes who aren't getting them. Right? But then you say, well, there's still a shortage. So the process continues, 
right, until the price rises back up here to $3, right, where you've reached equilibrium. So again, if you have a shortage in the market, right, there's going to be upward price pressure to push you back towards the equilibrium price. And so markets will often be in, in fact, arguably markets are always in some disequilibrium, a little bit below or a little bit above the, the um, equilibrium price. Because demand and supply are always shifting, you know, um, and always. But the idea is that ultimately there's always pressure as you move away from equilibrium. There's pressure to get back towards that equilibrium price, and that equilibrium price might be changing as we'll see in the next subtopic here. So here's an example. Okay, again, another humorous example of what happens in the presence of a shortage. So here we have a shortage, aka excess demand, right? So here's Wally, the engineer, says, "This week I discovered that the demand for engineers exceeds the supply." Right? So there's a demand uh, for engineers greater than supply. There's an excess demand. I responded by increasing my insolence and decreasing my productivity. Right. So if there's excess demand for my services, then I can lower the quality of my services. Right. To uh, you know, and still be in demand, and ultimately make sure that I've lowered the demand for my services uh, by lowering the quality. Right. And ultimately, he says equilibrium has been restored. To which the pointy-haired boss says, "I will never hire another engineer as long as I'm alive." Right. So again, Wally responding to a excess demand or a shortage in the market for engineers. All right, so what about changes in equilibrium, right? Um, so the idea is we have changes in equilibrium. How do we analyze changes in equilibrium? So we mean, remember, change in equilibrium means the equilibrium price has actually changed. We're not talking about the disequilibrium where the price is above the equilibrium price or the price is below the equilibrium price and it's, there's pressure to move back towards the equilibrium price, but where the equilibrium price itself has actually changed. Well, to determine the effects of any event, right, First, determine whether the event shifts the supply curve, demand curve, or both. Right? Remember, we gave the example of the trick, trick question about the what happens to the demand, the supply curve of tax preparation software, software when professional preparers change their price. Well, the answer is nothing happens to the supply curve; it shifts the demand curve. But decide the event that you're analyzing whether it shifts the supply curve, demand curve, or both. Right? Then decide which direction it shifts: the shift to the left or to the right. Right? And then use the supply and demand diagram to see how the shift changes the equilibrium price and quantity. So, consider, let's, we're going to use some examples. Let's use examples in the market for hybrid cars. Right. So, um, here we have, of course, so we have the price of hybrid cars, right, and the quantity of hybrid cars. We have demand to the land, supply to the sky, right, and we're ready. Let's look at our examples. We have our price and our equilibrium quantity. Let's see what happens if certain events change that equilibrium. So first, suppose the example would be a shift in supply. So su the event, suppose a new technology reduces the cost of producing hybrid cars. Right? So hybrid cars become cheaper to produce. And this is the market for hybrid cars, remember. Well, I've already sort of told you, you know, the first step is to figure out which curve shifts. I already sort of told you a shift in supply, right? So the supply curve is going to shift because the event affects the cost of production. Right? Um, so it's going to, the technology is cause, it changes the cost of production. That's going to shift the supply curve, not the demand curve. Right? Um, the demand curve, you know, it, it's not a factor that affects demand. It isn't the, the fact, you know, I don't, I, I'm willing to take advantage of something being cheaper and buy more of it. But my demand curve itself hasn't changed. My, my, the value I get out of the hybrid car hasn't changed. It's just cheaper for you now to provide me a hybrid car. Um, all right, well, step two is then which direction does it shift? Well, um, so the, it's become cheaper to produce hybrid cars, which means that, that we're willing to supply at a lower price, or alternatively, for any given price, we're willing to supply more, right? So that's a shift. That's a supply curve shift to the right, right? It reduces the cost. It makes production more profitable at any given price. Right? So we get a supply curve shifting to the right. All right. So that's step two. Step one: which curve shifts? Step two: which direction? Step three: you know, look at what happens to price and quantity. Well, we again have a new, as supply curve shifts to the right, we have a new equilibrium where the new supply curve intersects the demand curve. So, and at that new intersection, we see that price is lower and quantity is higher, right? The shift causes price to fall and quantity to rise. And that's our analysis of a change in equilibrium from a shift in supply. What about, here's another example, suppose a shift in both supply and demand. Suppose the price of gas rises and New technology reduces the production costs. We already saw the new technology reduces production costs example. But step one is which curve shifts again. Step two is the direction of the shift. Step three is what's the effect on the equilibrium quantity and price. Well, step one, which curve shifts? Well, both curves shift, right? We already saw the supply curve is going to shift from the new technology reducing production costs. But as the price of gas rises, right, what's that going to do? That's going to affect demand for hybrid cars. As, as gas gets more expensive, 
right? Then people want to buy hybrid cars more. All right. Step two, which curve, which way do they shift? Well, they both shift to the right. We already saw that, you know, as the new technology reduces production costs, supply curves can shift to the right. But again, as the price of gas rises, that's going to increase demand for hybrid cars. So therefore, it's going to shift the demand curve to the right. So all right. So then step. So then we draw. Okay, demand curve shifting to the right. We draw a supply curve shifting to the right. And the last step then is to figure out what happens to price and quantity. Right. Well, it turns out, of course, that quantity arises. Unambiguously, no question that we see the new intersection of the new supply curve, the new demand curve, right there. The quantity increases, and as we've drawn it, at least price increases. But the effect on price is actually ambiguous. The way we've drawn it, right? We've drawn that the demand shifts more than supply. Notice that, that, that this green arrow is bigger than this green arrow, right? Which means we drew the demand shift to be greater than the supply shift. If that's the case, right? Then if demand increases more than supply, then the price is going to rise. And so we see the price goes up, P2 is bigger than P1, and Q2 is bigger than Q1. But what if we drew it instead? What if supply increased more than demand? Right? So now the supply curve shifts out more than the demand curve. So now this, the, the green arrow corresponding to the supply shift is bigger than the green arrow corresponding to the demand shift. Notice what happens now. Again, quantity in a, you know, does increase and unambiguously increases with these shifts. But now because supply has shifted more than, than demand, the price has actually gone down. Right. And so, when you have you know this type of shift, sometimes you have it where where you know uh, sometimes you'll have it where where you you can determine for sure what happens to one variable but not the other. The other variable is ambiguous. It depends on which curve shifts more. Right. Um, in particular, here's a you know if both curves are shifting, if one curve is shifting, it's actually pretty easy. If only one curve is shifting, you can tell you can see what happens to price and quantity. But here you see, here we have you know shifts in supply and shifts in demand. And what you'll see is in every case, right, up here decrease in supply and decrease in demand, the equilibrium quantity goes down, but the price, we're not sure. Depends on which sh curve shifts more. Here in the upper right, we have a decrease in demand and increase in supply, right? The equilibrium price definitely goes down, but we're not so sure about the about the equilibrium quantity, depends on which which curve shifts more, etc. Right? So when both curves are shifting, you can unambiguously say what happens to one of these things, price or quantity, but there you can't say for sure. What happens to the other depends on how big the relative shifts are. So, under the topic of change in equilibrium, I'm going to leave you with some plot, some supply and demand puzzles. Um, and I'm actually not going to give you the answer and ask you to think about them. And we're going to, you know, I want you to give me your answer to these puzzles when I come back, you know, when we actually meet again in the class. But here's a puzzle. Every summer, the quantity of gasoline consumed and the quantity of tomatoes consumed both increase. Again, quantity consumed goes up for both, and therefore quantity supplied goes up. The equilibrium quantity goes up for both every summer, gasoline and tomatoes. However, the price of tomatoes goes down while the price of gasoline goes up. How is this possible? We consume more of both, but the price of one goes down while the price of the other goes up. What's going on here? Other questions, if, if you can answer that, if you can think about what the answer is there, to a little more deeply thought are is the following. You know, on average, do you expect the seasonal variation in gas prices or tomato prices to be more volatile? Right? We've just said that gas, you know, that gas prices go up every summer, tomato prices go down every every, every summer. Which do you think is more volatile if you chart tr chart it out? Um, you know, and why? You know, we certainly have our own experience, but why do you think that is? And what is the maximum expected price increase in gasoline? Not the maximum price increase, the maximum expected price increase. How much, if you told me that, hey, I think that every every year gas prices go up by 20% in the summer, um, would it be reasonable for us to expect gas prices to go up by 50%, 100%, 200% every summer? What's the upper bound on what we should expect prices to go up and why? And what about with tomatoes? What about you know the up and down variability in the price of tomatoes? How much can it go up and down? And, and what might be a mitigating factor? Or what might not be a mitigating factor in one, but in the other? Again, a little bit of a puzzle there. We'll talk about it when we get back. Again, this is something that people pose as a puzzle, but it's not a puzzle is the following, you know. People asking why is gas so expensive? Well, you know, ultimately, it's, there's not a question. You know, we it's a story of si supply and demand, right? You know, supply and demand will always give you the answer about why the price is what it is. Uh, but here's another supply and demand puzzle, which is kind of fun. True story. In 1998, a big freeze damaged a significant portion of the nation's orange crop. 
The price of fresh oranges increased, but the price of orange juice decreased. How do you explain that? Again, significant portion of the nation's orange crop was damaged because of the freeze, but the price of fresh oranges increased while the price of orange juice decreased. How do you explain it? Again, if you understand a bit about supply and demand that we taught, you should be able to figure that one out as well. All right, so the last topic of the chapter is this subtopic on prices and resource allocation. It's, it's a big topic, you know, but, you know, in terms of what it means, and, and it'll actually take a time during the course to really, I think, for you to fully appreciate what it means, but I'll talk a little about it now. So, first of all, we've sort of said the idea that, look, market prices adjust to balance supply and demand. Right. The price is going to, we just sort of talked about how when you're out of equilibrium, the, you know, the, there's pressure to move back towards equilibrium. So price is going to adjust to, e to balance supply and demand. Right? And so I sort of say supply plus demand, I don't say equals price, because that's, that's not really fair, but they are going to drive or determine what price is. Um, and one thing to always uh, use this the idea is the price is always right. right? There's some reason the price is where it is, right? unless there's some government intervention in the market like a price floor or a price ceiling. Right? The reason things are priced the way they are is because of supply and demand. And in that sense, the price is always right. Um, but think about this, right? So think about this. I saw this, uh, uh, I stole this, shamelessly stole this from something uh, somewhere, I can't remember. But, you know, you again, supply and demand are going to drive price. So you've got supply, which is coming from the producers, right? So you've got producers on one side. You've got demand, you know, which is coming from the consumer on the other side. And then what really is then, what you have to understand is there's then, in competitive markets, we have competition, which is the idea that the suppliers are, produ are competing for that consumer, but also the consumers, right, um, are competing for that limited supply, right? Or, you know, in the idea that, uh, so there's competition, you know, on both sides. That's what makes it a perfectly competitive market. Right? But lo and behold, you put all these together, and what do you get? Ah, oh, look, there's price, right? Supply, producer, demand, consumer, competition, and together we get price. Um, just a little memory device, I suppose. Another way to think about it is, is, is this idea of thinking about supply and demand as these pistons, right, that go up and down, right, the pistons of an engine. These aren't weights. At first I looked at this diagram, thought it was weights, like, you know, but no, they're pistons going up and down. And, and if, if, if demand is higher than supply, then what happens? Well, the arrow is going up here, it pushes price up. If demand is greater than supply, price goes up. Inversely, if the supply is higher than demand, then price will go down, right? So again, think about supply and demand being pistons on this arrow, which is the direction of price. Um, again, you know, want to know why, the, here's a little cartoon about why the price of milk is so high, right? Demand for milk. And the supply, here we have the cow, of course, on the missing, you know, on the side of the milk carton, right? You know, as supply goes away, you know, uh, demand stays the same, the price of milk is going to go up. Now, the big picture here about how prices allocate resources, this idea of, you know, um, understand that in any economic system, whether it was the communist system or socialist or capitalist, whatever, you know, the, the caveman system, there are scarce resources that must be allocated among competing uses, right? You know, what should be produced, how much of it should be produced, who should produce it, who should consume it, right? Um, and in a market economy, these things are all decide, are decentralized decisions. It's, there's not... You know, the textbook gives a, the textbook or one of the optional readings, I can't remember, gives the great example of, of a, you know, Soviet era official walking into a pharmacy in the U.S. and seeing all these products from everything from, you know, foot fungus to, you know, uh, to, you know, um, hair gel or whatever, all these pharmacy products. Right? And the Soviet official asked them, well, yeah, you've got all these products, but, you know, how do you make sure that you have the right products you know, all the products available, you know, at every store where they're needed, right? You know, that's got, yeah, it's too complicated a decision. Well, that's the Soviet mentality because that's how it was done, right? But in a market economy, it's, there's no central authority deciding that, right? Um, in fact, the results of the allocation are millions of people and businesses making millions of individual decisions, right? About what they want, you know, and, and, and what they want to buy, what they want to produce, what they can, what they can affordably do. Um, but the key is the prices. Prices are the signals that guide economic decisions, right? If the price of something goes up, I mean, I mean first of all, who gets the goods? Well, the answer is who's ever willing to pay it. If you have a market price, anybody who's willing to pay that price or more gets that good, right? And so, therefore, things like Super Bowl tickets go to those who are willing to pay the most for them, right? Um, which is not me, 
right? But is it unfair that I get the market price? Well, maybe you can argue about fairness, but the bottom line is the person who was willing to pay the most got it. And similarly, who produces? Well, the people who produce it right, are those who can make a profit at the market price. It's, you say, it's, well, it's unfair that this you know, f you know, mom and pop store went out of business or this factory went out of business or whatever. But the bottom line is, if somebody else is producing that good or service instead or some other business, it's because they were able to do it at that market price. And the market price is, again, this signal. Like, when they're not prices, right? We'll talk about later about externalities and public goods and these are markets for, these are things where the, there's no price for them. What's the price of national defense, right? We don't, we don't, we don't, you know, decide, we don't have a price tag. We, we understand the overall cost of our military, but individual consumers don't decide whether or not to pay a certain price for national defense. But also, it's not just that those prices are single, is, is that the market responds to those prices. When the price of a good rises, consumers demand less and producers supply more. You know, the, the idea is the reason the things that are at, that the, those products are at the pharmacy is because they there is sufficient demand and the the supply sufficient supply, you know, at a at the you know, sufficient demand to make it worthwhile to supply it. Um, as the price goes up, you know, that's where we will get more supply. Consumers will demand less, producers supply more, and vice versa. Right? And so the book talks about, you know, of course, we have the invisible hand there directing the economy. But then if the visible hand is directing the economy, then the price system is the baton that the invisible hand uses to conduct the economic orchestra. It's got to be, it is the visible part of the invisible hand is the price system. And just, uh, again, at the point with a little bit of humor, this one, first one is actually from the book. Right? It's in the book, right? You know, here's a guy selling an umbrella on the street corner to this lady. It's $2, okay? Then he suddenly realizes that the rain is starting to fall and says, you know, oh, and 75 cents. Right? So, again, uh, the idea in this case that he realizes that demand has just increased. So, therefore, he can charge a higher price. Um, on the same note, a little more blurry, but here's a cartoon from the old comic strip BC uh, about cavemen. So, here one of the cavemen comes up and says, I'll take one barrel of oil. It's Peter's oil. And he says, that'll be 15 clams. And then the other caveman says, I'll also take one. I'll take one also. He says, that'll be 30 clams. And he says, 30 clams, but you just, huh? demand suddenly skyrocketed. Right? Um, again, the idea is once you realize that, you know, if somebody's willing to pay something, that means that tells you something about what the right market price should be. Right? Which, by the way, if you've read the Michael, Michael, um, uh, the, oh, geez, I'm blanking, the Michael Lewis book on, on uh, flash boys or generally about about high frequency trading that's the idea right they they what they do is they figure out um, they get you know figure out that you are wanting to buy Apple stock that an order for Apple stock is coming coming down the line and they race out with higher fiber optic cable what are faster they're able to get there faster the market they buy up the stock that you want to buy and they sell it to you at a higher price right? and that's the, the idea is because you're willing to buy I realize that that's something I want to supply all right, um, so here's some examples in the press I want you to think about. We'll talk about when I get back. Here's a quote from the Ann Landers column. For Ann Landers, the, you know, Dear Abby, sort of the, the advice columnist. Right? The quote is the following. Pantyhose manufacturers could easily make hose that, don't, that, uh, hose that doesn't run, but there's a quote, unquote, conspiracy of self-interest to keep no-run hose off the market so they can sell more product. Right? In other words, what they're saying is that, that they could make pantyhose doesn't run, but because they want to keep selling more pantyhose, they intentionally keep it off the market. A product that consumers, according to this, presumably want, is intentionally kept off the market so they can keep selling more of their pantyhose that does run. Right? And my question is, how do you evaluate that statement? What do you think about that? Again, I'm not going to answer it now. Think about it. We'll talk about it when I get back. Another example, here's the following quote from a letter to the Wall Street Journal written by Richard C. Leone of the New York and New Jersey Port Authority. He says, quote, Kennedy and LaGuardia airports can't be privatized because their value is well in excess of $2.2 billion, but no buyer would be willing to pay that much. Right. Again, what do you think about that statement? Right. The airports have a value well in excess of $2.2 billion, but no buyer would be willing to pay that much. All right, so again, we'll talk about those, you know, when we are back face-to-face. -face. And lastly, I'll finally, I'm going to leave you on a joke. Um... These jokes are only available in the video version. I'm not going to post it on the slides, so uh, if you just watch the slides, you're going to miss out. Um, not sure if you're missing out too much, but... So, 
but to understand, of course, the delicate balance of supply and demand and, and the different roles they play. So a traveler is wandering on an island inhabited entirely by cannibals, right? Comes upon a butcher shop. Again, he's on an island entirely, uh, island of cannibals, he comes upon a butcher shop. The shop specializes in brains differentiated according to the source. The sign in the shop reads, artist brains, $9 per pound. Nurse brains, $12 per pound. Engineer brains, $15 per pound. And finally, economist brains, $19 per pound. Right. Upon reading the sign, the traveler noted, my, those economist brains must be popular. To which the butcher replied, are you kidding? Do you have any idea how many economists you have to kill to get a pound of brains? The moral of the story being, you must be able to differentiate demand effects from supply effects, right? In this case, the price is not high because of the demand for economists' brains. The price is high because of the minimal supply of brains among economists. All right, well, and so that's it. The, the summary sort of we went through, we talked about the competitive markets, right? The chapter summary, a competitive market is one where we have many buyers and many sellers, each with little or no influence. Um, and we use a supply and demand model to, to analyze these competitive markets, and they give us great insights about a vast array of markets. Um, demand, we learned about the law of demand, about the downward sloping demand curve, that the quantity uh, demand, quantity buyer's demand of a good depends negatively on the goods price, right? Um, it's not, but, but it's not just price that determines the demand. There's other determinants of demand, and those things are things that are shift the demand curve. Um, supply, we talked about the, we learned about the upward sloping supply curve. The idea that the quantity of seller's supply depends positively on the goods price. As price goes up, they supply more. As price goes down, they supply less. Other things also drive supply, right? And these are things, you know, they're non-price factors. They are, tend to be shifts in the supply curve. We then put supply and demand together. We learned about inter uh, equilibrium, right? But the intersection of supply and demand curve determines the market equilibrium, right? That's at the equilibrium price. We have quantity supply equal to quantity demanded. If the market price is above equilibrium, we have a surplus, and that'll push prices downward. If the market price is below equilibrium, we have a shortage, and that will push prices upward. And we can ultimately then use the supply and demand diagram to analyze the effects of any event on a market. Right? We can determine you know, which one of the curves or both that it shifts, determine the direction that it shifts, and then compare the new equilibrium. Right? Shift those curves and see what happens. Does price go up? Why don't it go down? What, what, what's going on you know, based on those shifts of those curves? Right? And ultimately, um, something we'll appreciate as we go forward. And of course, the idea that prices ultimately, that market prices, that, that, that markets supply and demand, and then the prices that those markets create are signals that guide the allocation of resources, right? Things that when prices go up for something, right, they become more expensive. Um, what happens is, of course, producers, you know, scramble to provide more of it, right, because they can get a higher price. Consumers consume less of it, and usually they do so by moving to alternatives they might not have been using before. Right, which also therefore producers begin to look for alternatives right, that are cheaper. But the point is that the, the economy can be sort of self-correcting, and it does so with the signal that is market price. All right, that's it. Thank you very much. Like I said, these slides will be posted on Applia, and uh, I will be uh, corresponding with you about our Wednesday class, which is going to be uh, the, the experiment. You don't have to be in class, but you have to be available during that class time at a computer. Talk to you soon.